Nearly 20 years ago, Infiniti introduced a compact luxury sports sedan called the G35. The G35 was so successful, it quickly gathered a reputation for being the Japanese BMW, and enthusiasts loved it, sales took off, and it really set the benchmark in the compact luxury sports sedan segment. Unfortunately, that was then, and this is now, and as you can see, this week, I'm driving the latest version of that car's spiritual successor. This is the 2022 Infiniti Q50 Sensory. Now, as you can see from the design, it hasn't really changed much since Infiniti introduced this model back in 2014. However, under the hood, we do have one of the more potent engine offerings as standard equipment, a three liter twin turbo V6 offering 300 horsepower and a starting price that well undercuts most of its European and Japanese rivals. So this week, we're gonna live with the latest Q50 and we're gonna find out, does Infiniti still offer a sports sedan that'll appeal to some enthusiasts out there? Stay tuned to find out. Now back in the day, the Infiniti G35 really started the horsepower wars in this segment. And when the Q50 came out, Infiniti kind of continued that tradition. As you can see today, it still kind of sets that tone. Because under the hood, what you find is a three liter twin turbocharged V6. That is the standard engine. And Infiniti essentially offers two different tune outputs of, that, of this engine. They used to offer a hybrid. They used to offer a two liter four cylinder turbo from Mercedes, but that has been discontinued, I believe, since 2019. So the output here on this sensory trim is 300 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. That's about 100 horsepower less versus the same motor that you find in the Red Sport version of this car, which also is the same motor that you find in the new 2023 Nissan Z, which I just had a chance to drive. The sad thing about the Q50 is you cannot get a manual in this car. It only comes with the company's kind of antiquated seven-speed automatic transmission, where they do have a new nine-speed and the newer Nissan products, it's still not under the hood of this vehicle. Now you can take your pick between either rear wheel drive or intelligent all wheel drive that my tester has for $2,000. With all wheel drive, it gets around 19 in the city and 27 on the highway. Premium gas is recommended. Uh, and in terms of the curb weight, this is a relatively heavy luxury sports sedan at just under 4,000 pounds. We'll go ahead and we'll test out the zero to 60, which I know the Red Sport will do it in around four and a half seconds. I suspect this car should be around a second slower with around 100 less horsepower. Let's go ahead and shut the hood and talk about the styling. Now this particular model here is painted in grand blue. It's an extra uh, charge for the paint for around $600 and it's a beautiful dark blue that I think goes well with the lines of this car. It's just got a very curvaceous looking design, which really hasn't changed much over the years. I think it, the car looked really good when it first came out, but now it's starting to look a little bit dated. It looks a little bit like a design that came out almost a decade ago. You can see a lot of curves in the hood that kind of are accentuated in the grill design of this car, where the grill itself, you can see, has a lot of bright chrome. I believe you can get a blacked out version of this grill uh, on the Red Sport. It should be slightly darker, um, or you can also get it from the dealer as an accessory. The emblem there, the Infinity emblem, you can also get it uh, a package where it actually will light it up at night, which happens to look very nice. And then you can see here, the headlights are full LEDs. You have LED daytime running lights, LED low and, uh, low and high beams, it looks like. And then you have an LED turn signal there and LED fog lights. I do like the front bumper. I think it's still a really attractive looking design. But overall, let me know what you guys think of the look of this car. Let me know if you think it's aged pretty well. Well, this car, when it first came out, um, was one of the larger vehicles in the, in the segment, but because it's so old, a lot of the other competitors have basically become this large at around 189 inches long overall. It's got a 112.2 inch long wheelbase. Remember, this is built off of the FM platform, so it's a front engine, midship, rear wheel drive uh, layout. So the engine itself is placed pretty far behind the front axle. Now looking at the wheels, you can see the sensory trim for an extra $5,700 includes these 19 inch wheels, along with the sport bumper. You've got basically square size 245 with tires uh, all around 245 40 R19 tires. If you guys go for a red sport with rear wheel drive, you'll actually have a fatter 265 tire in the back. There's really no indication from the front or the side that this model here is all wheel drive. And then Infinity used to put uh, a badge there that would say three liter T or two liter T or 3.7 when this car first came out, but they've removed that badge because all of them now come with a three liter twin turbo V6. Now looking at the side mirrors, you can see uh, they're body colored and they have an, an LED turn signal indicator. And you can see sunroof is included on this trim, just a standard sunroof, no paint roof. You can see there's a lot of chrome here in the bodyworks, And then the lines you can see 
are a little bit more distinctive along the side profile. I don't really like the way this is shaped here along the D-pillar. It's just a weird shape. It doesn't really do it for me. I think the front of this vehicle was more attractive when I first saw it. And then at the rear, you can see the Red Sport model definitely makes it look a lot sportier. There's no integrated deck lid spoiler on this car. You can see there's some chrome along here. The LED taillights are full LED, um, which I believe they were slightly refreshed back in 2016 but everything's still pretty much the same. Here is your one indication that your car is all-wheel drive from the little badge there. And then the exhaust, you can see the Red Sport has a little bit larger exhaust tip, which I've shown you on the new Z. This is just the standard dual chrome outlet. Uh, it just looks very tasteful, very purposeful. And it's still a relatively attractive looking design uh, from certain angles. Now opening up the trunk, the Q50 offers around 13 cubic feet of space. Uh, the seats themselves, they do fold down, it looks like in a 60-40 manner with a center pass-through, which is nice. The trunk is very usable. Um, and in terms of underfloor storage here, it's a little bit hard to actually lift up this storage area. But you can see, once you do that, there is a, looks like an area where there could be a spare, but this one doesn't have it. No underfloor storage, but overall, it's a usable trunk. So Infinity hasn't made very many changes to the exterior styling of this car over the years, but what about the interior? Now, before we get inside, let me show you guys the key fob. You can see this is actually the newest Infinity key. It's a variation of the old key, which is a variation of the old Nissan key, but it's a good size. It has features like unlock, lock, panic, and you also have remote start on the actual fob. I'm not entirely sure you can use the Infinity Connect app and remote start this car. I don't have access to it, obviously, because it's a press car, but at least it's nice how you get remote start on the actual fob, and it's also not a very large fob. No. Uh, the grand blue exterior of my tester is complemented by a black interior with real leather with the contrasting white stitching. I believe Infinity also offers like a white colored leather if you guys go for different colors. I've seen it on the Red Sport model, but this interior is kind of like a more classic design. The seats you can see are nicely padded, well bolstered. You have a, an eight-way power adjustment on the driver's side, same thing on the passenger side, and you also have two-person memory. The seats themselves are just heated, however. Infinity does not offer cooled seats on this car which I think is a missed opportunity considering most vehicles in the segment do offer it. The door panel you can see has a soft touch injection molded plastic, aluminum and real wood trim, padded area over here. All the window controls are one touch automatic up down, but you can see a lot of the controls are just old looking. They're the old switch gear. And then there's a 16 speaker Bose performance series audio system. That's actually standard on all trims, even the base version, which is nice. But I found the audio system to be a little bit bass heavy for my taste, but the clarity of it was just fine. Now getting inside to the interior, you can see it's basically like a step back into time from like 2010. As I get in and shut the door, the door actually still has a relatively solid sounding thunk, so that's nice. Start it up, you can see the button is right here. It's kind of blocked by the turn signal indicator. And then this car does come with a power tilt and telescoping steering wheel, which is definitely nice. And then the, the dash layout kind of has like this dual cowl design. You have a gauge cluster here, which used to move with the actual steering uh, steering wheel, but it doesn't anymore. You can see those gauges look really, really old. There's a very small, like three inch helper screen in the middle there, whereas everyone else is going to an all digital display. And then you can see here, Infinity is still doing the dual display layout where they call this Infinity in-touch tuition or in-touch control. CarPlay, of course, is up here on the eight inch screen. It's also a touch screen. It's wireless now, which is nice. You don't even get wireless CarPlay in a car like the Genesis G70, which is infuriating. And then down here, you have a seven inch dis display here, which uh, you can also put a menu home screen there. I imagine most of you will have it on audio or you'll have it on climate, uh, which is definitely nice. There's how you access your heated steering wheel and you can also access the heated seat through the touch screen here or the actual button over here where it does offer an automatic high, mid, low, but no um, cooled seat, which would have been nice. This is a nice, you know, thought process. I've seen dual screen layouts before in other cars, but I think the execution of it could have been better. Um, I just don't think that the size of it works. It's too small nowadays, and it's just a really dated looking display, but at least it has the wireless CarPlay. Um, when I push this little camera button or put it into reverse, you can see this car does have the full top-down 360 camera with moving object detection, which is basically their rear cross-traffic alert. The graphic, however, look at that, just looks really crummy, and it looks like it's from 2010, so it's a really old looking display. Um, going back to the display here, uh, going back to the CarPlay, click that here, you can see for some reason it decided not to work anymore, which is really, really odd. Uh, this car also does have GPS that's embedded, it's included with this trim, but for some reason, as you can see, the screen decided to black out and it's not coming back on. Maybe it'll come back on later on in the video, but let's go ahead and move on because the dashboard materials, you can see, uh, have a soft touch injection molded plastic with this kind of faux stitching. It's also along here. This is real stitching along the actual center console. You have a little bit of a storage area here with a 12 volt power connector. 
Um, this controls the seven speed automatic. You can also use this remote controller to control that screen if it decides to work. If you don't want to use the touch screen, your drive mode selector is here. Uh, there's a personal sport standard eco and snow mode. Um, I'll drive it. I'll show you guys some of the different modes, but the car doesn't really feel all that different to me in any of the drive modes from my initial impressions. Now the screen is coming back here, but it's still blank in terms of the CarPlay or anything else, so that's super annoying. Uh, over here, you can see the wood is included on the sensory trim, uh, which is definitely nice. It's a genuine wood with some aluminum trim. My phone, as you can see, is a massive iPhone 12 Pro Max. It doesn't even fit in this cup holder, and there's no wireless forward charging pad for this car whatsoever, so it's a little bit annoying to find storage for this car. You can see how dated it is. Um, this is a nice padded area here, and then you can see there's a USB-C and an A port in there. I guess you're going to have to stick your phone in that center console, although it's not really that big. The seats, like I said earlier, are comfortable, supportive, but they just don't really hold you in place nicely. The Red Sport has a slightly more aggressive seat, and then you can see the glove box is damped. It's a bin style. It's lined with felt, which is nice. And then over here, the rest of the cabin, you can see auto dimming and review mirror, although it's got a huge bezel. Everyone's kind of go to, gone to a more frameless design. And then you have some LED map lighting in this cabin. There is enhanced LED lighting, ambient lighting in here at night. There's some lights in the cup holders over there. But overall, the sunroof, you can see, it's just a standard roof. Uh, you can open it up in the standard way but overall the interior while it is still comfortable and offers a good amount of room the tech in this car is just such a letdown um, but overall i think if you're okay with that it should be a fairly nice place to spend time taking a look at the back seat this car Taking a look at the back seat, you can see the Q50 does have a longer wheelbase compared to some competitors, which means you get around 35 inches of legroom back here. Now, 35 inches is pretty class competitive. Some competitors have definitely matched this car in terms of the rear seat legroom space. Now, when I get back here, you can see somebody like my height, five foot seven, can get back here and get pretty comfortable. Shutting the door, you can see the materials here are actually still soft touch plastic or soft touch injection molded plastic, real leather here real wood so this is nice how they didn't skimp some competitors like the tlx have skimped there massive hump here for the rear drive shaft tunnel of course because this is a rear drive car but in terms of legroom you can see it's not bad good foot space you have dual map pockets or storage pockets you have rear seat vents two usb charging ports there which is nice and then the seats themselves here in the center you have an armrest that folds down and gives you two cup holders over here which is definitely an improvement over some some competitors. And then the seats themselves, they feel actually pretty comfortable and supportive, uh, but no features like rear sunshade here or manual sunshades here. But overall, this is a usable back seat. Uh, so I find that this car stays competitive in this area. So here we are in the 2022 Infiniti Q50. I used to have so much love for this predecessor vehicle to this car, the G35. And when this Q50 came out in 2014, I really liked the styling, didn't really understand the name change. But Infiniti seriously have left this car out to dry for way too long. It is in serious need of a complete redesign, but you do get a couple of things with this car that you actually don't get with the competition, and mainly it has to do with the standard twin-turbo V6. I mean, I was not expecting Infiniti to give us 300 horsepower for $42,000. It is a fantastic deal, and this sensory trim that I'm driving also has all-wheel drive, so... I know the zero to 60 performance of the Red Sport model, which is like four and a half seconds. Never tested this model um, with my equipment before. So let's go ahead and see what we can get here. We'll go ahead and brake torque it. It's in sport. Ooh. Nice. The slow shifts of the um, seven speed auto are kind of what holds this car back. But you know what? 5.33 seconds is very effective. This is the base engine, remember. For this price, you basically get a two liter turbo four. Although the four cylinder competitors, I've tested them at around 5.8 seconds. So really this car is about a half a second quicker. It's still quicker, but not as quick as I thought it would be like a sub four second or sub five second car. And it's because of this seven speed auto. The seven speed in this car really holds the engine back because I've driven the nine speed auto in this car's platform mate, the new Nissan Z. And the nine speed is such a huge improvement. It would be nice if Infiniti would put that transmission in this car, but let's go ahead and try it one more time because I want to see on this stretch, what number I do get. It launches at around 2,500. Feels really strong off the line. 5.58 seconds there. This is with it going slightly uphill. So 5.3, 5.5 is very respectable performance 
especially for a car that's the base engine. And the V6 also sounds good. It doesn't really feel all that much slower than the 400 horsepower tuned version. Although in the Z, the transmission just makes it so much faster. It's really held aback by this car. Now, in terms of the suspension and the handling, I've only actually driven the Red Sport model in the past, although I have driven a base 3.7 when this generation first came out, and I really hated the steering in the car. I hated the way the chassis responded. Infiniti has made improvements, of course, to all of that. The direct adaptive steer technology is not on this model, which they've claimed they've made improvements to that, which I haven't had a chance to drive yet. See right there, I floored it and it didn't want to shift out of the top gear. That was really lazy and lethargic. Really disappointing in a car that's supposed to be a sports sedan. But this model here, the steering is still way too light, still way too numb and devoid of feel. I have no idea what the front tires are doing. The FM platform that this is built on still feels relatively stiff and secure. This is a great chassis actually, and it still it feels wonderful in the new Z. And this car, it feels like it's been watered down, of course, for luxury car duty. Um, the seats in this car also are relatively comfortable. They don't really hold you in place. They don't hug you in place. The Red Sport model will up things up, of course, with more aggressively bolstered seats. It'll have more aggressively tuned suspension uh, and more aggressively tuned steering, and the sound will also be louder. This car in general kind of just feels like a step behind, a generation behind. Put my foot down there, the all-wheel drive system just puts the power down well. And in this instance, the car feels fast. It still feels one of, like one of the quicker offerings in the segment, which is wonderful. But remember, everything's kind of going electric. And the fact that Infiniti doesn't even offer a hybrid version, they discontinued that in 2019. They dropped the two liter turbo four as well, um, which you know kind of simplified things. I wonder what the future of this car is. It's, it's still a relatively pleasant driving car, especially if you haven't had a chance to drive the competition. But the problem is, is once you do that, you really start to see the flaws in this car. It feels disconnected. It feels really, really behind in terms of the ride and handling balance. Although I will say the ride in this car used to be a tad on the harsh side. Infinity has tuned it out and made the ride a lot more comfortable nowadays. You can hear the back starting to slip a little bit there. Putting my foot down again. Transmission doesn't have enough gears to put the engine into the meat of the power band. Uh, and it kind of is a little bit lazy to shift still. No paddles on the wheel with this model, but you do have a manual mode here where you can uh, use the manual mode on the shifter, which the rev matching on the downshifts are fine. Won't go into first there. The suspension also stays relatively flat. Although right there, I tried to upshift there and it was a little bit uh, shocking. It, it was a little bit jarring, the shift. Uh, visibility is also pretty good in this car. You can see out of the front and the back and the sides really well. The driver assistance actually comes standard on this vehicle. It comes standard with Infiniti's adaptive cruise control, automatic emergency braking. Uh, I, I don't believe it has their version of Drive Pilot, um, which I've tested in some of the newer Nissan products. Remember, this is a very old car that dates back to 2014 and the platform dates back to 2003. Um, but overall, in terms of a, a sports sedan, it falls short for me. In terms of a luxury sedan, it falls short for me. The interior feels like I'm in a fancy Nissan, especially with the old two-screen display. Now, again, some manufacturers are doing a two-screen display, but they just do it a lot better than Infiniti. I think the, the eight-inch screen here, the seven-inch screen here, one big 15-inch screen would have just been better used. I do like the fact that this car now has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. That's something you don't even get in some luxury competitors like, like the Genesis G70. The instrument panel here also looks fairly dated. Uh, you know, everyone else is going to an all digital display. Um, but overall, I still think this car has a place in the segment. I mean, obviously if you want the most horsepower, you want a V6 twin turbo for the price, this is one of the few that it's gonna give that to you for such a cheap price. Uh, I mean, the price seriously undercuts all of its competitors. The Kia Stinger is one that comes to mind that is around the same price, if not slightly cheaper, I believe. But really, when you start hustling this car around some corners, you get, a, you get really let down by the steering feel, by the numb feel of the chassis. The fuel economy is rated at 1927. I've been averaging around 23 MPG in mixed driving. On the highway, I got around 25 MPG. So again, the nine speed auto could improve the gas mileage even further. And as much as I'd like to say, you know, skip this car, which I think there are definitely better competitors out there. If you can get one of these for a deal, like a lease deal, which Infiniti was really doing with this car for a long time, or you know, some kind of um, discounts for MSRP. I'm not entirely sure what dealers are doing for this car, but I do know that uh, Infiniti's 
are struggling right now. Sales of this car have tanked over the years hard. Um, and the Q50 is one of those vehicles. And at their peak, Infiniti sold like 45,000 of these. And last year, they only did like 14,000. So it's definitely a car where you could find a deal. And it's not a bad vehicle, as long as you're okay with feeling some, like you're driving something that's behind the times. But overall, it's still quick. It's still comfortable. It still has you know some tech features, but you're constantly reminded that there are better choices out there. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what Infiniti does for the uh, next generation. So after spending a week driving the latest Infiniti Q50, driving this car for this long a time really just kind of makes me sad for Infiniti because there was a time where this brand was the benchmark in terms of a compact luxury sports sedan. And oh, how far the mighty have fallen because this car here, while it does offer some strengths, obviously I like the engine, zero to 60 in 5.3 seconds, it makes a good noise. The rest of the car is just a huge letdown. The styling is starting to look dated. The interior, while it's comfortable, the tech in it is super dated, although Infiniti did at least throw in wireless CarPlay, but the screen resolution just sucks. And also, the rest of this vehicle's competition has really just moved forward. Everyone's kind of going toward electrification. Everyone else has far better tech. And Infiniti should be at the forefront of that. I don't understand why they've let this car just sit there and die over the years. And it really shows in terms of sales because Infiniti at their peak used to do nearly 50,000 units every year. In fact, the old G sold at a maximum of 70,000 units a year. Now, obviously that was then where everybody bought sports stands. Everyone's buying crossovers now. Whereas last year, the company managed to move just under 14,000 units of this car, which is just a huge cut in terms of numbers. Now, when you look at the pricing of this car, it, is, it does make it more enticing because this car starts at around $42,000 for the base luxury version of this car. Add $2,000 if you guys want all wheel drive. The sensory trim that I'm showing you is kind of the mid trim. It's about $5,500 extra. It includes things like the 19 inch wheels, the sport fascia, uh, the navigation on the inside, the upgraded leather. It's kind of a worthy upcharge. My tester here with all-wheel drive and the grand blue color stickers for just over 52 grand. Now, 52 grand would also get you something like a Lexus IS and Acura TLX, which I think both of those competitors are better. If you're looking at the German competitors, the Audi A4 is also a strong value, but keep in mind, all of those vehicles that I've mentioned have a four-cylinder turbo. So if you want a V6 twin turbo, this is one of the few out there. I think you can also look at a Genesis G70 and a Kia Stinger. It should be priced along the same of this car. Uh, however, this car, I believe, still offers a good deal value if you guys value the most horsepower or at least a strong sounding or a nice sounding V6. Other than that, it's kind of a letdown and I think Infiniti seriously needs to consider introducing a fully redesigned model, which I'm hoping they will, but who knows, honestly. Infiniti is on a mission to kind of re-evaluate and redo their entire lineup. Um, but right now, if you guys want to pick up this vehicle, it's certainly worth a look, but just keep in mind, you are getting something that is very old that is also going to be replaced very, very soon. But with all that said, hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the brand new 2022 Infiniti Q50 Sensory. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook, and as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.